Hello everyone, welcome to the 10th episode of the ISJL Virtual Vacation. My name is Nora Katz, and I am the Director of Heritage and Interpretation at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. The virtual vacation has covered a lot of ground in 2020. We learned about the early history of Jews in the South, visited towns where Jews have made a significant impact, grappled with the connections between Southern Jews and Black civil rights, toured Southern Jewish cemeteries, and so much more. But the goal of this series isn't just to share the history of the Jewish South. It's to introduce you to the people who live here, have roots here, and care deeply about this place. That's why I'm so excited to share today's episode with you. As we learned in our first episode, many Jews in the South have connections with the retail business. When Jews arrived in the United States, many worked as peddlers, eventually earning enough money to settle in growing towns and cities to establish or work in retail stores. This pattern tells us a lot about Southern Jewish economic mobility, the way that Jews were and are tied to each other through social and family bonds, and the position that many Jews held in their communities. In the 19th century, many Jews ran dry goods stores, stores that were intimately connected to the region's cotton economy and therefore the institution of slavery. We learned about some of these businesses in episode two when we visited Natchez, Mississippi. As cities and towns grew and changed after the Civil War, so did Jewish businesses. In the 20th century, another generation of Jews established retail stores specializing in all manner of goods, from clothing to shoes to hardware and farm equipment and so much more. In the 1960s, 1970s, and beyond, movement from small towns to big cities, the influx of big box stores, and then the rise of online retail caused many of these family businesses to shut their doors. Still, their legacy remains in the Jewish names above storefronts on the main streets of small towns, and in the memories of those who owned, worked at, and patronized those businesses. Today, I want to introduce you to people who are intimately connected to this history, and who have something important to tell us about the experience of being Southern and Jewish, especially as it relates to running a small town retail store. We'll meet a few current ISJL board members, as well as some folks who were interviewed over the years as part of the ISJL's oral history program. Some of these people are no longer with us, and so I'm very honored to share their voices with you today. As we meet these people, you'll start to see recurring themes in their stories. Themes of family and friendship, of memory and nostalgia, of assimilation and tradition. First, we'll meet Gail Goldberg of Greenwood, Mississippi. Gail is a current ISJL board member, and she and her husband and brother-in-law own and operate Goldbergs and Connerleys, based in Greenwood and Indianola, Mississippi. Gail's story is rare in that the Southern Jewish businesses she runs continue to flourish. Goldberg's was founded in the 1920s, so it's one of the oldest businesses we'll talk about in this episode. Let's meet Gail now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Gail Goldberg. I live in Greenwood, Mississippi, the heart of the Mississippi Delta. Um, I am uh, a board member, a proud board member of the ISJL, and I am also um, currently, um, for 40 plus years, uh, involved in a retail business in our community. I've got the rag business or the retail business in my DNA from both sides of my family. My father's family was actually in the Mississippi Delta as early as the late 1870s with um, coming to this country from Lithuania in the whole backpack peddling story and landed in a really small community, Glendora, Mississippi. And at one point they had, at that time, what was called dry goods stores. Um, so after World War II, my dad and his two brothers joined his parents. And at one time they had eight or 10 retail doors in the Mississippi Delta. When I moved to Greenwood in 1977, um, I 
became connected to my husband's retail DNA. His grandfather, Morris Goldberg, was a shoemaker in Poland, Russia, right on the border, and immigrated in 1920 to the United States, ended up in Greenwood, and the bought a or acquired a very small space at the corner of Howard Street in Carrollton in downtown Greenwood. And again, as has evolved, the 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 space where Morris Goldberg was making shoes became uh, a retail footwear store. The store is still there to this day. Um, next year will be a hundred years that that store has been has has created this footprint in downtown Greenwood and in the Delta. Um, so it's a uh, it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty cool story. Obviously, we have a retail store because that's how we make a living, and so it's. You know, it's 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 serious and it's focused, and um, and sometimes it's uh, a huge challenge, as this past year has been. Uh, however, the 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 coolest part of it, the benefits and the 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 really the access to our community is is so interesting and so important because um, a lot of times certainly I'm in the back working um, on all the behind the scenes of running a retail business but the interactions with customers who become friends who are weaved into the community has um, just accrued so many wonderful um, opportunities. Um, be, being Jewish, and I've said it many times, in, in a very small community with very few Jews um, means that it's my responsibility and it's, and it's my privilege to serve as an ambassador for our Judaism. And I, I am truly not exaggerating not not this past nine or ten months because of COVID, but I, I truly have some sort of question, comment, um, pretty much weekly for years and years and years about our Judaism. And I guess it over the years, depending upon you know where I, wh whether my children are young and in grade school and um, please come out to the school and do a Hanukkah program or as they got older and they were in high school you know please um, let us bring our um, high school Sunday school group to your shul to, to our synagogue or you know all these opportunities became in many ways more amplified if that's the word or that the access was there from our having sort of an open door <laughs> because that's what a retail store is and it it has brought um, so much awareness and uh, understanding and uh, really uh, I humbly say respect for our Judaism and respect for us as Jews to um, live in a community that's predominantly um, Christian. Always a privilege, always a responsibility to um, communicate, to share, and to really be a part of a learning curve. Um, living, living even in 2020, living in a community that's predominantly 
Christian gives us unlimited opportunities to share our Judaism. And that's, that's really important. And in my own little space here, um, I, I try to, I try to make sure that I'm available and accommodate um, whatever requests come my way, if, if that makes sense. And over this 40 plus years, it's been, you know, it's, it's been so much. And it can be somebody popping in the store and saying, I got invited to a bar mitzvah. What's a bar mitzvah? To as complicated or as sophisticated or whatever the word might be is, you know, some, somebody in my family is dating somebody that's Jewish. Help, help me through, help me understand this process to really um, partnering up with our community um, on so many programs and projects. Um, you know, I, I love, I love and I hope that we rotate back to a place where we can share a community interfaith cider. And that's, I mean, there's just so much opportunity. So I, I love that I'm a part of that, a small part of it. Goldberg's, the business, um, started in 1921, as I said, Morris Goldberg, shoemaker, brought his eldest son, Harry Goldberg, um, with him uh, to Greenwood. And um, in, in, in its heyday, um, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, um, when, when downtown Greenwood was in its heyday, um, Goldberg's was humbly, I say, the premier shoe store in the Mississippi Delta. I mean, there wasn't anything between Memphis and Jackson close, and we had the 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 finest um, ladies ready to wear, and men's stores, and jewelry stores, and gift shops, and on and on and on. So. Um, through uh, an expansion of the space, the, the footprint downtown is, is, is fairly large on the corner, marks the spot. Um, as the economy changed, demographics changed, retail business changed, we um, added or we had the opportunity uh, almost 20 years ago to put in another location in Greenwood on Park Avenue, which is um, approximately 6,000 square feet. And so going from pure footwear, we have evolved to um, apparel, um, outdoor clothing, you know, Yeti coolers, big green egg grills. So we, we have constantly changed our model to meet what retail looks like every year and it's constantly changing um mike mike often laughs that he said his uncle harry would be um just so amazed to see and what could have never imagined that we would be selling grills in a shoe store <laughs> and we are so much we, we have such a diverse uh, offering of product now. We have two boys and um, Mike's brother has two children and um, no, no one has any uh, interest at all in um, being involved in the business. So, uh, personally, for me, I think it's a, it's a solid decision. <laughs> so, um, or I, I, will, I will always remember we had, we had a huge uh, downtown event. Um, it was called Crop Day, Cotton, Cotton Row on Parade or something like that. And 
downtown Greenwood was just packed, packed. So um, we had bands and all sorts of people and concession stands and it was a it was a huge sort of um sort of a back to school kind of event and our oldest son uh i can't remember how old he was 11 or 12 and we were like hey you need you need to be at the store we're gonna put you to work and all that and at the end of that day he was like i gotta figure out something else to do so uh which he has so how um obviously that means that uh at some point there will more than likely be be we will be the last of the goldbergs in this uh retail business mike's uh uncle harry absolutely harry goldberg um was uh a really smart kind um i've heard him so often described as a prince of a man he was he was uh he was a great he was a uh he was uh very much the the person that you know really really set the business in place um and he was also extraordinarily involved in our community um he died before i got on the scene and um mike's father his younger brother was very involved in the business and um but by the time by the time 1977 came along um it was mike my husband and his mother elsa goldberg who interestingly uh, another sidebar to this conversation she uh was born in germany um escaped at age eight and was um in a ghetto until she was 17 in shanghai um she and her parents entered the united states through the west coast had um distant cousins in memphis and ended up in memphis had a blind date and married mike's father 1950 so she she has been in greenwood since 1950 and she is a huge part of our store um, so she worked uh pretty much full time until december of 2016 when she had a fall and broke a hip and she's she's still um her mind is great and so um she's no longer involved in the business but mike and my mother-in-law which i lovingly call mill and so does everybody else um really uh really rang in the business i i got on board in 77 as i said and um my role has expanded and expanded and expanded and mike's brother uh jerome after he finished school in the late 70s also joined the business so it's it's been the four of us running the business the 20 plus the 20 year old location new location new to us on park avenue is is where um is where i hang out where mike hangs out 100 percent of the time so and that's evolved into um a, a very a very good store and a very very important part of what keeps us moving forward next we'll meet perry lewis Perry currently lives in Mobile, Alabama, but she grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. She has fond memories of growing up in her father's women's and children's clothing store on Capitol Street in the 1920s through the 1940s. My name is Perry Lewis, Perry Millstein Lewis. I'm originally from Jackson, Mississippi. I was born and raised there. I now live in Mobile, Alabama 
and um, I uh, grew up in Jackson. So my father, Sam Milstein, opened a store in the 1920s called Milstein's Women and Children's Store. It's on Capitol Street. And it was a large store with uh, two, two stories, but the main part of the store was all on the main floor. And he sold um, all kinds of women's clothing and shoes, and there was a hat department. And then on the balcony upstairs, there were children's clothes. And um, in those days, this, um, we're talking about the 20s, 30s, and early 40s. Um, everything was downtown. There were no shopping centers or malls or anything like that. People came downtown and it was always busy. If you went downtown any day in the street, there were people walking up and down the streets and there were two movie theaters right near where we were, the uh, Majestic, which um, when I was a child was the only theater and it was all in silent movies. Everything was in black and white. And um, my mother used to take my sister and I down there sometimes when she was working in the store and just park us in the theater. And uh, of course, everything was safe in those days. And there was no um, talking. It was just an old man sitting in the back playing an organ. And I couldn't read yet. My sister used to read the subtitles to me. And um, we, uh, you know, we loved our store. We, the sales ladies were all these lovely ladies that would, every one of them wore a black dress and they were always made up and had the hair done. <clears throat> Things were pretty formal back in those days. And people came downtown, they were dressed up with hats and gloves on. And um, so every, that was a very happy time. This was before World War II and um, store flourished. Yeah, it, downtown Jackson was great. It was, um, you know, everything was down there. People came down, people, um, we always took the bus. We, you know, a lot of people didn't have a whole bunch of cars like they do today. And my sisters and I, we either walked everywhere or took the bus. And it was so easy. You just, you know, walked a couple of blocks, got on, number four bus line and it went all the way downtown to my dad's store. The store was at the corner of Capitol and Farish Street. And Farish <clears throat> was the main uh, shopping area for black people. And so when his business uh, was doing so well, he opened up another store a block down on Ferry Street, and then eventually a third store a little bit further down. And also on those blocks, there were a lot of um, stores that were owned by Lebanese immigrants. Most of them's last name was Thomas. They were, I think they were mostly brothers or cousins. And they all became, they were all good friends of my father's. The, the things that they sold were mostly like workmen shoes and boots and things. So there was no conflict there. They all became good friends. They, they, were, they were strictly business relationships and they weren't, uh, they didn't, you know, they weren't social outside of business. But um, they all visited in each other's stores. And um, it seemed like all of them were, were doing well. They always had customers. But the thing is they sold different items and there were maybe three of those stores with the name Thomas on them. And um, they, they all themselves were immigrants. They all spoke with accents. But they were just, um, you know, finding their way and making a living doing that. And they, the merchants on the street uh, they all seemed to get along with each other. And I had just some kind of business relationship. My dad had friends that owned stores on Capitol Street, other Jewish men that owned stores. 
And um, one of them was Cohen's, Cohen's Men's Store. Well, that was about a block down on Capitol Street. And then there was another person, Harry Herman, who owned a men's store that was um, also about a block or so from my dad's store. Another one was Harry Lefkowitz, who owned a jewelry store that was kind of the opposite direction. And they all used to uh, get together. I think they tried to do it once a week for lunch. And they would go to the Mayflower, which is still there. And uh, that was the best place to go then and probably still is. And um, those were this group of Jewish men that were all downtown. Uh, um, that just seemed to be where a lot of the Jews made livings was opening their stores and their parents had done the same thing in a different kind of a store, but that's how they, when they came to this country, that's how they made their money. They, they couldn't own land when they first came and they couldn't work in factories, they wouldn't hire them. So they just walked around as my father's father did as a peddler in Natchez, Mississippi, and until someone helped him go into business. And so I guess that's kind of the history of the Southern uh, merchandising. <laughs> there were just shoppers uh, in there all the time. I mean, it was strictly women and children in there. It, it was it was a busy place. He he um, he had the layaway plan. Uh, I think that was something that was just starting. That was a, really a new concept of buying. So this was during the depression in the '30s, and most people didn't have any money to shop. But on the layaway plan, you could pick out what you wanted to buy and put down maybe a dollar. And uh, then they would keep, put it upstairs. They, my father had a big storage room upstairs and they would um, keep the item or the dresses, whatever you were buying. And just um, the people would come in every week and pay what they could pay on it until it was paid off. So sometimes it sat there for months while they, they came in and maybe they paid a dollar or a dollar and a half a week. They came in every week and paid something. And then uh, around Christmas, uh, families were putting up toys that way. And they would come in sometimes as late as Christmas Eve to pay them off and get the toys in time for Christmas. So that layaway plan was kind of a lifesaver for a lot of shoppers because um, the 30s were, um, a lot of people just didn't have any money. But somehow they managed, you know, doing that. During World War II, uh, my father was uh, appointed the, for the county, the uh, war bond chairman. And um, he, the store was all decorated in red, white, and blue. All of the stores on Capitol Street, everything was patriotic. Everybody had flags out and red, white, and blue bunning. And uh, people were, <clears throat> the country really came together. And in front of my father's store, he put up a booth where you could, uh, someone sat in there and people walking back could buy war stamps. Well, they usually didn't buy bonds, uh, but they would buy stamps and put them in their little, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but these little stamp books. And when you got, um, I think it was, uh, your stamp book was filled, it amounted to about $18.75. And then five years later, you could cash that in for $25. And so uh, my sister and I went down on Saturdays and sat in the booth. And um, it was just a great time. I mean, there were a lot of uh, families we know that lost people in World War II. Um, there were a lot of soldiers that didn't come back and all of that was very heartbreaking. So my father 
I uh, had this uh, wonderful store for many years and then I guess it might have been in the early 50s, uh, Jackson was spreading out, shopping centers were being built uh, out West Capitol and out North State Street. And uh, I guess my dad could see the writing on the wall that downtown was not gonna remain the vibrant place that it had always been. And so he sold his stores and that was in the early 50s and he got his real estate license and um, opened up a real estate company uh, downtown, but further up near the old capital and um, became a commercial realtor and was very successful with that for many years. The retail stores downtown, there were several of them that were owned by Jewish people and um, Eventually, they all succumbed to the same thing. It was um, the downtown moving out, people not coming downtown anymore. So eventually, I think they all probably sold their stores. But it was a, a great time at the time that it was going, which would be, have been the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. Moving forward in our chronology, we'll meet Rachel Riegler-Schulman, Rachel is the past president of the ISJL board, and she grew up in Wynn, Arkansas. She'll tell us about her parents' business, Handy Dollar Store, and the experience of growing up there in the 1960s and 1970s. My name is Rachel Riggler Schulman. I am currently living in Highland Park, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Uh, but I'm originally from a very small town in Arkansas called Wynn, Arkansas. It is about 60 miles west of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I grew up uh, with a Jewish population of 10, uh, five of them my immediate family. Um, I guess at some point there were 12 of us. My grandparents passed away when I was quite young, uh, but there were two older couples who lived there who were Another one of the two were like grandparents to me, and then a, a, a man who lived there, uh, Mr. Drexler, whose picture is in was in the uh, ISJL office for a while. It may still be there, um, but that was the Jewish population of when when I was growing up. We went to Memphis for uh, temple and religious school. We were dragged there, and um, but that's that's where I grew up. I've been associated with the ISJL since 2010. I've been on the board. I'm the former chair of the board and now I'm just being a lax board member, just doing what I need to do. I have Southern Jewish stores in my blood. Uh, my grand, my dad's parents, uh, when they were Lithuanian immigrants, they both came over when they were in their teens and they started out in New York, but made their way to the South and ended up in Wynn, Arkansas, where, which is where my dad was born. And he grew up from the time he could work, working in some type of store. Uh, they, my grandparents had multiple types of businesses through the depression and afterwards from a candy store to variety store. The last, the one that I know most about was Wrigler's Variety Store, which is what my dad was working on in when he married my mom, uh, when my, which was in 1960. And that store could not uh, produce enough of a revenue to support my grandparents and my dad's growing fam, our growing family. So my dad started what was becoming popular in the mid 60s, what was known as a, a dollar store. And that does not mean like it does today that everything sells for a dollar. It was a type of store where they sold a, a wide variety of, of items from health and beauty aids to clothes to school supplies to automotives to just about everything under the sun and my parents opened their store in 65 66 
I believe that's the, that's the, the was right in that time frame. And um, then a couple of years later, my grandfather closed his store and came to work for my dad in Handy Dollar Store. And that was the store I grew up in. And both my older sister and younger brother and I worked in the store from the time we could see over the counter. Uh, we started off all sacking and worked our way up to stocking and checking. And we always worked in the store. <laughs> I have lots of memories of that. Um, and they are lots of good ones. We had really, really great people who worked in the store. Um, I mean, because I started out working on Saturdays during the lunch hour when I was really young from 11 to 2, because those were, Saturday was the busiest day of the week in the store. I mean, that's when people came to town. It was a farm, when was a farming community and that's when people came into shop. So we would come out, we kids would come in and work during the lunch hours and help out because it was busy and that's when people were taking their lunch breaks and we regular kids would come in and work. Um, we were, I don't know if we were always the best laborers. Um, we, uh, often, my sister and I often tease my brother because we would find him hiding in the, in the back in the warehouse. But uh, he overcame all that and he, my brother David, uh, took over the store and worked with my parents after he graduated from college. So he definitely uh, outgrew that part of his life. Um, but we all grew up working in the store. There were great people, as I said earlier. Mr. James had worked with my grandfather and then came and worked with my dad and Miss Spencer. She was there for years. My parents in the 70s opened a fabric store too, Wrigler's Discount Fabric Store. And we worked there. We had, I don't know how many matching outfits made. My mom and sister and I, we had matching outfits made from there. So we worked in that store for a while, pulling uh, patterns from the pattern drawers. Um, but there are lots of, I mean, I, I, I can't even tell you how many memories we had during the Christmas season. It was always busy, busy when we were out of school for Christmas break. We worked until right up until Christmas Eve and there were longer hours. Um, and in the summertime and maybe wintertime too, we had a fireworks stand because fireworks were legal in Arkansas and we had a fireworks stand. It was, it was a busy place and I mean, it was our livelihood. That's what supported our family. Well, I know about ours, it was a family business. It was something that, I mean, I think about it now and I think about it as having lived through a marriage that I think about how my parents did it together and my grandparents did it and um, I had aunt and uncle in Forest City who were married and had their store, Cohen's Department Store in Forest City, Arkansas. And I think about how these families did it as, and, and ran their businesses as couples and families and their kids were involved. And it's just not something that's um, done that much anymore. And it's almost a, a dying art, maybe, um, art form. Um, these families stuck together and worked together and prayed together and you know raised their kids together and sent them to Jewish camp together and drove miles uh, to get to uh, religious school and to have Jewish friends and Jewish um, you know just Jewish congregation together and I think about that and um, it really, I, I'm so thankful that we had this um, growing up and that my parents, um, you know, were able to do this in a time where um, they were faced with great odds and not surviving because, as I said, stores like Kmart didn't make it and win. Benjamin Franklin didn't make it and win. Um, 
other stores came and went, uh, other dollar stores, and we did. And we uh, and chains are there, but not many small independently owned family dollar stores made it. And I give my parents so much credit uh, for doing that. I really do. It's kind of sad there aren't as many um, businesses like that anymore. So, uh, and I value that experience that I had growing up in that. I think it, it made me who I am today. It gave me an experience that I know my children didn't have, especially growing up in Highland Park. They had no idea what it was like growing up in Wynn, Arkansas. But it's something that, you know, I really am thankful that I had growing up. I'm not sure it shapes how, like where I shop so much. I'm not sure if that has shaped it, but there's one thing I do that I know it's affected. When I try on clothes, <laughs> I always hang back up the clothes on the hanger after I try them on, because I remember people trying on clothes in our store and just throwing them. And I, I just couldn't believe people would do that. So I go try on clothes in a store. I always rehang them back up on the hanger and put them on the hook. Because I'll go in a, in a dressing room and people have thrown clothes all over the place. And I think it's just so disrespectful <laughs> and rude and, and everything. So that has affected me. I also am, am um, when I was, this shows in my age, when I was started working, they did, our store did not have the automatic change dispensers. So you had to count the change and you had to count it back. And my dad said, if we make a mistake in counting change, it's their, their win, your loss. So you always have to count the change correctly. So I always think about that. If someone gives me the wrong change, then, you know, I, I gotta, I don't know, I always think about how much change I get back and how that affects me but I don't know I just think about the clothes in the dressing room is one of the big things that I always think about now when I go into stores I think my dad what dad and mom were really well they were just what I think they were brilliant people they were very good business people they thought about things Ahead of time, um, my dad invested in property in the Wynn and Wynn in the surrounding area um, early on, and he bought some property on the outskirts of Wynn, and maybe thinking he'd build, this, you know, expand the store, build another store, but they ended up uh, building mini storages on that property, which was an incredible investment in the time. I think they opened those in the 80s. Um, and when they decided that um, they were going to, you know, the store, I guess Walmart came in 1976, which I remember distinctly when it opened in Wynn. Kmart opened and we had other dollar stores in Wynn. That was a real scary time for Handy Dollar Store, whether we would make it through Walmart coming to town and these other big, uh, big box stores, but Kmart did not make it. Other stores did not make it in Wynn as long as Handy Dollar Store made it, but we made it. My parents figured out that they could, they had specialty items that Walmart did not carry and that we could carry. And they focused on those things like we had Levi jeans and Walmart at the time did not carry Levi jeans, but Levi jeans were popular in our area and important. And there were other items that they focused on that we sold that Walmart didn't sell. And they were able to promote and sustain the business. And they did that in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. So they ended up uh, closing the business in the late 90s. Um, and then David, my brother, continued on in the mini storage business, which my parents had started in the 80s and grew and developed that. And in the early 2000s, he and his family and my parents all moved to Hot Springs, Arkansas. 
where um, my brother continues to live and has expand, he expanded his many storage business and went from there. Rachel's parents, David and Joanne Riegler, sat down with my colleague, Dr. Josh Parshall for an oral history interview in 2010. They both passed away in recent years, so we're incredibly privileged to have this interview with them. I wanted y'all to hear from them about their experiences running retail stores in Wynn, Arkansas. First, you'll hear David talk about the family business of his childhood, Riegler's five and 10 cent store. And then you'll hear both David and Joanne talk about Handy Dollar Store, a business that they founded together in 1962. My dad moved to Wynn, and he and another man had a partnership in um, a, a business that was called the Candy Shop. And uh, uh, here, too, they, they served, uh, it was, had a soda fountain with a marble top. I have a picture of the soda fountain. And they... Uh, sold uh, cigars, cigarettes, candy, sandwiches, uh, and cold drinks, things like that. And then at some point there was a disagreement uh, in the two partners and uh, dad started a five and 10 cent store and the other partner started a, 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 a dry goods store. And uh, I, Let's see, my sister Mildred, Mickey, was born in Wynn, and I was born in Wynn. And I recall uh, playing in the street in front of the store with a sand pail uh, before we had paved streets. And uh, I uh, remember that my mother would uh, take care of the house, do the cooking, and uh, <clears throat> after lunch, she would walk to, walk to town and, and work in the store until it was time to go home in, in the late afternoon to uh, uh, meet the children from school, if school was in session, and to prepare the evening meal. Uh, my family did not have very much money. I remember I did not know what was going on, but uh, at some point in the Depression, Dad, uh, uh, I guess, went into bankruptcy. Anyway, he, he lost his business and had to have some sort of help, but he was able to get back into business. And in, in my days, we uh, managed. Uh, I worked in uh, Regular's Variety Store, uh, as long as I was able to. Uh, I did that uh, after school, I did that on Saturdays, and uh, I worked in the Wrigley's Variety Store until I went off to college. And it, it, when I'd come home on holidays, I would still work there. And uh, still later, when I was in the Army, and I, if I got a furlough and would come home, I still worked. <laughs> at the uh, dime store. Uh, he, he, I, my sisters did uh, the same. We all worked there because we, we had to work for a living. We opened the store in February of 1962 and I was supposed to work there. Only thing, I became pregnant with Robin and had to have quite a bit of bed rest. So I, nev I never did have to work in that store at that time. And so we had Robin in on September the 26th, 1962. And uh, we were absolutely thrilled <laughs> to have her. And, uh, and we had uh, this dollar store, which at one time employed 25 people. And we had Christmas parties, and we dealt with the whole gamut of people. So, and then David uh, opened a mini storage business. We were trying to think what year we opened that mini storage business. And 
I think it's probably 25 to 30 years ago. But probably I, so. It was. But I don't. I, I didn't come across anything to give me. Some, uh, we ran it out of our dollar store business, and uh, Dave, our son, uh, originally he thought. He, was, he said he was going into uh, advertising, and he lived in Memphis for a while and worked for a company, advertising company. And then one day he ended up on our back step. When we got home from work, we found him sitting there, and he wanted to know if he couldn't come back and go into business with us because his dad said he was going to try and sell that business. Uh, he, didn't, he had hit 65, and he was going to be 65. He wanted to get out of it. And so David wanted to, he decided he would like to come into that business, which flabbergasted us because he sure didn't like working in it as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we said yes, and he came into business with us. And after, after our son was in it for a year, he kind of supervised him. Then he b basically stepped out of it and let Davey take over, which... I think that's one reason for Dave's success. He wasn't under his father's wing. He was his own man. And, and I was a partner with him, but uh, I bought most of the soft the clothes and all, and he bought the other things. But then he got so he bought clothes with me. And it, it turned out to be a great working relationship. And then we ran the mini storage out of that business. And eventually, after David got married in uh, 1997, he decided that he thought, the mini storage business was a lot better business than the retail store. Originally, he said he did not like the mini storage business. He liked the the, <laughs> the, the dollar it. store business better. But after he was there for some time, he, he... He decided that mini storages were not as demanding as a store that you had to keep open seven days a week, you know, all those hours when you had all the employee problems and we had the opportunity to sell it and I think much to David's credit here he's we survived Walmart Walmart came to win after not very long after they opened their Walmart doors they came to win and we survived Walmart and at one time we survived Walmart and Kmart at the same time so Kmart came in but they didn't last very long so and we survived uh, Jerry's chain. Uh, <laughs> they, they were our competitor for a while. <laughs> so we've been very fortunate and very blessed. I mean, and our children have, you know, have been a constant source of pleasure and enjoyment. Each of them had to work in the dollar <laughs> store. Each of them hated working in the dollar store. But, and of course, of course uh, David, well, David, in his hiring of employees, uh, <laughs> says that, that when he interviews them, he can really tell somebody who, who's a goof off and, and uh, somebody's not going to work because he was just, <laughs> just like that and, and he knows exactly what to look for. So there's a reason we chose to present this episode in December. The retail business booms at this time of year, as people across the country shop for Christmas and holiday presents. Jewish-owned businesses in small southern towns catered or cater to an overwhelmingly non-Jewish clientele. So many people have the experience of shopping at a beautifully decorated retail store run by people who don't celebrate Christmas. We're going to hear from our interviewees again and learn about their experiences of holiday sales in their stores. First, we'll meet Frida Stein, who grew up at Grunfests in the small town of Cary, Mississippi. She and her husband Jake were in the retail business as well. They built Steinmart into a national chain. Let's meet Frida and then hear from all of our interviewees about their Jewish Christmas memories. I'm Frida. Runefest Stein, and I was born in Cary, Mississippi, a little country town near Vicksburg, and uh, had a very beautiful life, country life. It was a lovely little country store, which is still there. Describe the store. Describe. Because you remember it as a oh. little girl. Well, during the holidays, at Christmas, of course, they had fruit. 
up front. Oh, they had baskets of grapefruit and oranges and apples, which we didn't carry during the week. And oh, it smelled so good. You know? You'd walk in and get the scent, you know, of that citrus fruit. It was, I remember it to this day. And they also carried some toys, you know, for Christmas. And I can see those shells. And uh, I played with the toys, you know, and I tried to help arrange them. And I was just a little child. So, uh, as I said, I truthfully <coughs> cannot remember any unhappiness. I can remember being punished and being spanked by my brothers for doing something, you know, but not. Uh, I had a very, very happy childhood. As Jewish people, this is how we make a living, and obviously fourth quarter is um, a huge, huge part of, of, of how we, of how all this works. And so, you know, we decorate the store and we fully participate. And um, I, I love that so many people, um, our customers and our friends um, are still very aware of our Judaism. And so, you know, some uh, would say happy Hanukkah or, or would say, enjoy happy holidays or, or what whatever sort of nod there might be to uh, as opposed to a Merry Christmas but um, I love a Merry Christmas also because I know this the spirit and the heart is there it's it's there's a zero zero negativity it's it's uh, it's all it's all good and um, as I say now, this is definitely a time of the year for lights and um, whichever whichever side you land on um, we, we hope that we all have bright lights and and bring bring in peace for all around Christmas just uh, probably around the first of November uh, my father created a toy land in the back of the store it was back in one corner that was near the stairway that went up to the children's department. And his office was upstairs on that balcony, kind of on one end of it. <clears throat> and he was able to look out over the whole store from his office. So the toy land was uh, just like a fairy land to me. There were toy shelves just full of toys, and, um, toy soldiers, little cars. Of course, there were so many dolls which I loved. And my mother always told my sister and I to pick out some things that we wanted Santa Claus to bring. And uh, one year, my father had a carousel brought in and it was, um, it, it had about, had six little ponies on it and it, it moved around in a circle. You, the children could get on the horses and it played music. It was just, you know, like, <clears throat> walking into something you've never seen before, and it was wonderful. Well, we always, the store was always decorated for Christmas. Like there were, we sold Christmas trees and Christmas lights and decorations and cards and kind of candy and everything. I mean, gift wrapping paper. And so we sold all that stuff and we had decorated trees in the store. So. For me, that was very exciting because that was my time to get to help decorate a tree because we did not have a Christmas tree at home. And all my friends had Christmas trees and we were the only ones without a Christmas tree. So that was fun to help decorate Christmas trees. And um, the Christmas season, you know, was our busiest time of the year. And it was, um, you know, the Black Friday was not a big day for us in, at Handy Dollar Store. It was not some big, you know, break or make our year day. Uh, but the Christmas season was our big time of the year. And leading up to that, you know, that was our very important shopping time. And we were busy, busy, busy. And Christmas Eve, when it finally got there, we were all so happy to say Merry Christmas and good night. And uh, that was always a big thing. And I, 
I just remember my dad would not let us say Merry Christmas until Christmas Eve. And I always would be like, why not? And he's like, well, not everyone is celebrates Christmas. We don't celebrate Christmas, so we don't tell everyone Merry Christmas because not everyone celebrates Christmas. I'm like, well, everyone else does but us. But he said, no, that's not always true. I said, okay. So, but we, on Christmas Eve, we could say Merry Christmas to people. Thank you. We always said every sale at Handy Dollar Store ended with, thank you for shopping. Thank you and come back. That's how we ended every sale. But on Christmas Eve, we could say thank you and come back and Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you so much for your continuing support of the ISJL virtual vacation. We'll be back in 2021 with our 11th episode. Until then, you can catch up on all of our past episodes and read our past emails on our website. Stay safe, take care, and happy holidays.